welcome to this post-Thanksgiving edition of Zalagamoto. I hope everyone is able to enjoy the holiday, and if you happen to live somewhere that didn't have a holiday last week, I still hope things are going well as we start the run-up to Christmas. My decorations are not up yet, there's just been way too much going on, but maybe next weekend. Anyway, if you're a returning viewer, thanks for coming back. And if you're a new viewer, my name is Dave, and this is my 8- and 16-bit Sega collection, consisting of titles for the Master System, Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega CD, and 32X. Still a long way from complete, but it's getting there. However, I didn't want to just buy a bunch of pieces of plastic, silicon, and paper to have them sit on a shelf and collect dust. I wanted to, well, number one, play all of these titles, good and bad. But then I also thought that all these titles deserved a deep dive and showcase not just the games themselves, but a uh, look at the packaging, including the lost art of the game manual, and perhaps throw some background information about the titles and the companies behind them, as usually these titles don't just come out of a vacuum and appear out of nowhere. If that sounds interesting to you, I'd recommend that you subscribe. I've been doing this for almost three years now, Hence how we got to 136 episodes, and, well, this is a pretty big bite to chew, so I'm going to be doing this for a long time to come to get through all this madness. When looking at a collection like this that covers multiple consoles, one thing that happens somewhat frequently is that the same title will appear on multiple consoles. Say, for instance, Mortal Kombat, which has releases on the Master System, Genesis, and Sega CD. This is always interesting to me, even in cases where the games are largely similar, because they're never exactly the same. And especially in the case of games that appear on both the Master System and the Genesis, I'm always curious to see just how close the games are with the technical limits of the Master System, at least on paper, being far less than the Genesis. This is exactly the situation that we're looking at today, with this week's game, Paperboy, for the Genesis. Back during the first year of the channel, I reviewed the Master System version of Paperboy in episode 32, and I usually try to space these games that are part of a series 100 episodes apart, so that there's time to breathe in between the reviews and give the games a fresh look. But you might notice that this isn't episode 132, it's episode 136. Or maybe you don't care, I mean, I wouldn't. But anyway, the reason for that is because I had an odd situation occur where I managed to get the Master System version of Paperboy before the Genesis version. I had Paperboy 2 for the Genesis, but for some reason I just never stumbled across the 16-bit original. So having the schedule set up like this, I went to eBay last week, actually while I was working on the water margin video, and thankfully this copy showed up literally the day before I posted that video. If you're not familiar with Paperboy, I'll go into some more details about it in a bit, but the short version is this is a port of the Atari arcade game that was originally released way back in early 1985. So, how faithful is the Genesis port of Paperboy, and how well does it compare to that Master System version I mentioned? Well, we'll talk about all that and more, but first, a look at the package. So, this is my copy of Paperboy, freshly added to the collection this past week. For whatever reason, even though I've been collecting for a while now, I've never managed to run into a complete copy of this game, which is why I finally had to just go grab it from eBay. But in doing research into finding a decent copy of the game, I think I finally figured out why I had such trouble obtaining a complete copy of the game, which had just puzzled me, seeing as how this isn't a terribly valuable game. Well, apparently Paperboy is one of the titles that was chosen by Majesco for re-release towards the end of the Genesis lifespan which resulted in there being both an original plastic clamshell release, which you see here, and then also a cardboard box re-release. That cardboard box re-release appears to be the much more prevalent copy, with only a few of the clamshell versions appearing for sale, and what seemed to be somewhere between 5 and 10 times more of the cardboard box versions being available. And just to further illustrate that, I actually tried to buy this a month ago, closer to when it was originally supposed to be on the episode schedule, but at that time, there weren't any complete copies of the clamshell version on eBay. As to why that clamshell version is more rare, I can only guess that with Paperboy 2 releasing a year or so after the original, Tengen shut down production on it fairly quickly to focus sales on the sequel instead. 
Okay, enough about all that. What about this actual copy? Well, I'll be honest. While I did want the clamshell version just to it being the original release and not being a budget product, I honestly didn't care that much about its condition. So something that was just in decent shape was going to be enough for me as long as it was complete. This copy was the best of the bunch. The clamshell itself is in great condition with no scratching or gouging, and the hang tab is fully intact at the top. Unfortunately, the inner cover is a bit rougher as there's some water damage on both the front and the back on the clasp side. But thankfully, it's not too bad, and there's just some minor discoloration and wrinkling. I've certainly seen way worse. As far as the actual cover goes, Tengen used a slightly modified version of the Paperboy artwork and logo from the original arcade machine, which was instead used on most other releases at the time, seen here on the NES version. I say most because there's some notable exceptions like the United States Master System version, which just goes to show that Sega just couldn't get out of their own way when it comes to Master System cover art in the United States. Not that the Genesis version is a work of art, but at least it retains the look of the arcade machine. Now, here's something extra nerdy for you. Look at the spine. Notice anything? For some reason, this is the only Tangan release for the Genesis with a non-yellow font on the spine, which is even crazier considering the logo on the front is in yellow. Seriously, find me another Tangan Genesis title without yellow on the spine. On the back, there's that same blue... Ah, jeez. The arcade hit that really delivers. Ugh, I don't think I need to say any more about the back after that, but it does feature four good quality screenshots in the usual Tengen format surrounding flavor text. Quickly, the manual is in okay shape with some corner curling, but this is part of why I wanted the clamshell version, as the re-release has one of those cheap Xerox black and white manuals instead. The manual itself is simple, as you would expect, but I do appreciate all of the details covered, including an itemized list of all the obstacles in the game, as they could have easily skimped and taken the easy way out. Okay, that's the oddly rare package. Let's get to the game and see if this Genesis version is better, or worse, than the Master System port. Most arcade fans, or just gamers of a certain age, are probably familiar with Paperboy. However, that's certainly not everyone, so let me explain what Paperboy is, or was. Paperboy was released in the arcades in early 1985 from Atari Games, who at that point was still a player in the arcade scene, even though it was a drastically different company from the original Atari Incorporated that had been split up the year before due to the video game crash of 1983. Paperboy was actually one of the first games produced by the former arcade division after the split and ran on their more advanced Atari System 2 arcade hardware, which was notable for utilizing what was at the time a higher video resolution than what was found in standard arcade setups. And you can definitely tell if you play Paperboy on an original cabinet or watch video of a playthrough, the pixel art in the game certainly looks to have smaller pixels and more details than your average 80s arcade machine or even any of the 16-bit home consoles, including the Neo Geo. Along with running on some nice arcade hardware for 1985, Paperboy also utilized a very unique control scheme. Well, unique on the surface anyway, as the controller consisted of not a joystick, but instead a set of handlebars with buttons below each handle that would be used for throwing the newspapers. I say unique on the surface because in reality, this controller was actually very similar to the yoke controllers that were used on their Star Wars machines internally but I commend Atari for coming up with another application for that style of control, rather than just another joystick, trackball, or steering wheel. Between the original controller and the more advanced arcade hardware that the game ran on, Paperboy was Atari Games' arcade killer app for 1985, bridging the gap between Marble Madness and 720 or Super Sprint. However, if I'm being honest, I think much of Paperboy's arcade success was due to the high-resolution graphics and the handlebar controller versus actually being a decent game. This isn't to say that the original arcade machine is bad, but it certainly isn't a game that I enjoy very much. It feels very much like an average early 80s arcade game, which I suppose is how it should feel, but the problem is that those types of games were always designed to be quarter munchers, which focused more on getting players in and out versus actually having depth to the gameplay. In Paperboy's defense, however, one big thing that makes it stand out from the early, early 80s quarter munchers 
is that there's actually a goal to achieve, other than playing on similar looking screens over and over until you eventually enter your name on a high score list. You have taken the role of the neighborhood paperboy. What's a paperboy, you ask? Oh, right, it's 2021 and newspapers barely exist these days, and they haven't been delivered by children in decades. Anyway, once upon a time, it was totally acceptable for children to ride around suburban neighborhoods on their bikes, delivering newspapers to subscribers, and even collecting money from them. Paperboy eschews that last detail, but does give you a neighborhood to ride through consisting of 20 houses. You begin the week on Monday and are assigned 10 of the 20 houses as subscribers and given 10 newspapers to go deliver to said houses. Of course, just having to deliver the newspapers to the subscribers would be far too easy, so as you ride down the street, you'll have to avoid all sorts of obstacles and enemies that apparently have something against kids riding their bikes through the neighborhood. Also, to liven things up a bit, you can collect more newspapers as you go, which allows you to trash non-subscribers' houses. And let me tell you, it's actually quite satisfying to hurl a newspaper through someone's window while you're riding down the street. Assuming you don't use up all your lives and you deliver a newspaper to at least one of your subscribers, you'll make it to the next day of the week, and here's where my point about the game actually having a goal comes in. You see, you're not just trying to set a high score via throwing newspapers at the right time, you're actually trying to survive a full calendar week, keeping your job until Sunday. Paperboy might still be fairly repetitive, but making a game where it can actually be completed makes the game stand above many of the other early 80s arcade games and gives the game a sense of replayability that just high score chasing can't provide. So far I've really just described the arcade game and not discussed the Genesis version specifically, so I should probably rectify that. Unsurprisingly, the Genesis version of Paperboy is an accurate reflection of the arcade machine, and honestly, it would be more newsworthy if it wasn't considering the fact that there's a seven year difference between the game's first appearance in the arcades and then finally coming to the Genesis. But just because the Genesis version is an accurate port, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good port, and there's definitely some weirdness going on with this title. When comparing the graphics to the arcade version, they actually aren't bad, even with dealing with having to be at a lower resolution. There's definitely some detail missing, but the game looks like Paperboy, complete with all the many different enemies that are out to get you, depending on what paper route you're trying to run. More on that in a minute. And in fact, of all the consoles and computers that this port originally appeared on, the Genesis version is definitely the best of the bunch as far as trying to get the feel of the original game across. There is one glaring detail that was left out, however, the house numbers. A somewhat important detail for letting you know how far down the street you are is gone, and I don't really understand why, especially when they were included in the much simpler Master System version. I certainly wouldn't expect a perfect copy of the arcade game, especially with trying to squeeze everything into the smaller space of 320x224, but even the NES tried to implement street numbers, even if they were illegible. While the presentation of the game is largely a success, the sound is more of a mixed bag. The Atari System 2 hardware featured multiple sound chips controlled by a 6502 processor, similar to how the Z80 controls the sound subsystem in the Genesis. And indeed, the main synth chip used was a Yamaha YM2151, very similar to the Genesis YM2612. As a result, the Genesis soundtrack is able to sound very similar to the original arcade version, with its use of similar synth tones. It's not a perfect copy, certainly, but it sounds much better than the Master System version, and it's light years ahead of the dumpy sounding NES port. Yeah, Pat, I said it, the Paperboy soundtrack on the NES is awful. Anyway, I mentioned that the 6502 controls multiple chips in the Atari System 2, and one of the other chips that was used is the TMS5220, and you'd be forgiven for not knowing what the hell that is, but it's actually an advanced version of the chip that was used in the Speak and Spell Kids toy, and it provides, you guessed it, the ability to process digital speech in games. Yes, this is the same chip that was used in the Gauntlet cabinets to produce the famous Warrior Needs Food Badly line. Paperboy takes things to the next level and has plenty of lines included for the Paperboy to say, usually when responding to crashing into something, but sometimes to celebrate a good throw as well. And the lines actually amuse me a good bit. They take some of the sting out of dying, which happens often, and are usually tailored to the specific death. For instance, 
The cat's kind of big, isn't it? When you get too close to one of the cantankerous kitties. Or, I hate that kid when getting tripped up by one of the kids on big wheels. The problem is, as you can imagine, even with the arcade hardware having a dedicated speech processor, it still sounds like crap by modern standards. Sure, it was cool in 1985 when digital speech and games was still a novelty, but the samples are rough to say the least. So with the Genesis version arriving in 1992, surely Tengen went through and cleaned all those samples up, right? I mean, hell, the Genesis was the console of the soon-to-be-released Sports Talk Baseball, so clearly it could handle a few voice samples. Well, sad to say, not only did Tengen not improve on the samples, they didn't even make them sound as good as the arcade version that, again, came out seven years before. Yes, you heard me right, the voice samples in Paperboy sound worse than the original game, to the point of, if you don't know what the Paperboy is saying in some of them, they're just unintelligible garbage, ruining that element of the game. I mean, I suppose they get points for including them at all, since none of the other versions had them retained, but I don't know, maybe they should have included an option to turn them off, just like there is for the background music. It certainly would be more useful than that. From a gameplay perspective, Paperboy plays about as good as you would expect an isometric arcade game converted from a yoke-style controller. As in, it's fine, I suppose. There's definitely some quirks to it, and some of the collision detection seems a little iffy, but overall I can't complain too much about how the game controls. And I do like the ability to use any of the buttons to throw the papers, much like spinning in Sonic the Hedgehog. You can just use the button that feels the most comfortable for you. The level structure of the arcade version is represented here, with each of the paper routes, Easy Street, Middle Road, and Hardway included, each with their own enemy setups and house layouts, and they each get crazier as the week goes on. Along with the innate difficulty of the route you pick, one of the few options available is the choice to choose between Easy, Medium, and Hard overall difficulties, effectively giving you nine ways to play through the game. Which is nice, and new players are definitely going to want to start out on that easy version of Easy Street. Paperboy on the Genesis is a bit of a tough game for me to assign a rating, just simply due to the fact that I don't enjoy the game as much as some other people do, and I think even the original arcade version got by with some of the novelty aspects of the handlebar controller and the speech. But the more I played the game, especially in getting footage for the video, the more I appreciated a lot of the small details that are present, like getting a paper stuck in a bird bath, or the physics of the newspapers having a different flight path depending on how fast you're pedaling. And just when I would be getting into the game, a speech sample would play and I would just get enraged with how half-assed and lazy they are. Ultimately, I ended up deciding on giving the game two stars, just due to the fact that it's the best home port of the game in existence. Having said that, I don't think I can overstate how bad those speech samples are, and if you didn't like the arcade game, this version is definitely not going to convert you. And that's it for Paperboy, again. I remember thinking that the Master System port of Paperboy was good, and that the two stars I gave it was more for me thinking the game as a whole was just a bit eh. But I went back and watched footage of the Master System version in preparation for this video, and while I still think it's okay, the Genesis version is clearly better. So if you really want to play a somewhat repetitive, clunky arcade game from 1985, this is the definitive port. Man, I am not looking forward to reviewing Paperboy 2, but thankfully that's a problem for another year or two. Next week on Zyogamoto, it's a game that I honestly can't believe that I'm actually playing. Not because it's rare, as it's not, and it can actually be found pretty cheap on eBay, and I found my copy locally a while ago. No, I never thought I'd play it because it's a kid's game, and frankly, it's based on a children's television show that was so incredibly annoying to me that I made sure to never turn it on from my kids. But in the spirit of doing research and educating myself, this is actually a good opportunity to learn something, as because I dislike the idea of the show so much, I honestly know nothing about it beyond the surface, so maybe in reviewing this game, I'll learn why the show was so incredibly popular at the time. Or it'll confirm all my biases, which would be nice too. Either way, things are about to get purple around here. Please remember to subscribe if you like this video. And remember, whatever you like to play, have fun and be excellent to each other. Later.